seeing this pod, podcast series for the first time. Welcome to Filmmakers Uncut. This entire pods, podcast slash live stream is meant for um, you know, really diving into the heads of people in the film industry and learning about how they became successful, learning about their journey, learning about the struggles that they had, learning about the creative process, as well as fix it, fix the echo. We have echo problems again. I don't think we have echo. <laughs> Pat, do you have he um, headphones on on from your computer or are we on speaker? Uh, let me grab my headphones real quick. Sounds good, thank you. That's why there's like, <laughs> just give us a second Instagram. We'll oh, I can hear it, I can hear it. Yeah. Testing, testing. I have a big bulky headphones, I'm gonna try and get these guys to work. No worries, take your time. If you could uh, plug headphones into your phone as well. He does, yeah, he does. Have does. Them. Yeah. Oh, okay. Because I can still hear my audio. Today. Yeah, because his computer oh. is projecting audio. Oh, so, we just so it's going through oh, Instagram. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah bud. What? For some reason, live streaming services, like none of them, you can go live on Instagram plus like YouTube, Facebook, like all of that. Instagram just doesn't work. Here, I'm going big boys. Nice, nice. Can I fix it? Yeah, as long as you hear the audio through there. Test, 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 test. Yeah, yeah, yep, yeah. I can't I can't hear you. Okay, perfect. Is someone in the in the chat, if you guys can just let us know if we fix that echo problem. Someone's saying it's still there, but no, they said that before. Okay. Um, cool. So let's get started here. Dan, you want to run? Yeah, I'll do the I'll do the intro again. Yeah. Uh, thank you guys for joining the live stream. Um, the whole entire goal of this pod podcast slash live stream is to really dive into the minds of people in the filmmaking industry. You know, learn about their journey, learn about their struggles, um, dive into you know where they get their inspiration, you know, what makes you stand out in the industry, stuff like that. We have an awesome guest today, Patrick Hall. Thank you so much for joining us, my man. Um, Pat, before we get started, do you think you can give everybody a little bit of an introduction, you know, a biography about who you are and what you're doing nowadays? Yeah, for sure. Well, thanks for having me, guys. Um, I am a director living in Venice Beach, uh, Los Angeles, and uh, I'm Currently work with Step Studios and been with them for about four years. Um, who are some awesome collaborators, and uh, yeah, been lucky enough to have a interesting journey these last four years. Uh, just turned 23 last October, and uh, and yeah, that's awesome, man. Yeah, um, let's talk about some of the brands that you worked with. I feel like people who might have just like learned about you for the first time today, don't fully know like your level of expertise because yeah, you work for a studio and you're a director, but you've definitely created some amazing work. I know you've worked with Adidas, you've been um, you know a part of eSports. Can you talk a little bit about like the brands that you've worked with and, and the you know the type of content you produce? Yeah, uh, I mean, through the years, it's, it's been a lot. I've worked with uh, Adidas, Oakley, uh, Red Bull, um riot games league of legends uh asics outside magazine um facebook um i <laughs> it, I'm, I'm trying to think of all of them uh june shine has <laughs> been a really fun one um uh meundies it's the 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 list goes on but uh, Foot Locker maybe um but but yeah no been uh been been making fun advertisements and, and commercials for the last four years and uh, yeah kind of I kind of like to ride the visual effects and um, and kind of like practical um, I really like that combination of bringing in kind of my post background as well as with my onset live action directing capabilities to kind of create 
things that are original, things that people haven't really seen before. Mm -hmm. And how did how did you kind of come across your your style? Um, you know, you've been a filmmaker since you were a kid. So did, was it just like a slow progress of discovering what you want, or was there just like one project one day that you just kind of like you know took control of and it just stuck with you and you just kind of continued doing the same type of style? Yeah, I mean, I yeah, I started when I was about thirteen. Um, doing kind of like small commercials around Santa Barbara where I'm from and uh, then I slowly got involved into participating in the film festival uh, that was there and did that for about three years um, and then went to Chapman University for my freshman year uh, back in 2016 and then right before sophomore year was about to start I ended up uh, taking a gap semester um, and pursuing, uh, I was editing and directing uh, a lot of editing music videos and just kind of wanted to feel out kind of my, you know, working in the industry as I got a little bit of a taste of it after the summer of my freshman year and things just kind of picked up and the ball started rolling and I really kind of got started as an editor and that was kind of the, the main, I would say the best way to get involved with people that I wanted to work with. Um, because and also being 18, trying to get my foot in the door, uh, it helps editing because, you know, people are just looking at the work that you're doing. They're not really concentrating on the person behind it. And so I had jobs where they had just seen my work and they had no idea how old I was or who I was. And so they would just send me a drive. I would do the work and they'd be super happy with it. But I feel like sometimes those opportunities wouldn't have opened up if they had known that I was like 17 or 18. <laughs> so, um, but that's the way I kind of got my foot in the door uh, with like the crew that I work with and really just like working hard. I, I wanted to make sure any, um, any production or any project that I got involved with, I wanted to leave people with a good taste in their mouth of working with me and uh, so that they could come to me or they could, you know, have good things to say about working with me that would just broaden and grow my network and then slowly that turned into onset opportunities and then eventually getting some directing opportunities. That's awesome. Can, can you talk about maybe like your first big break, like the first big project that someone handed to you and say, yo, like we want you to direct this and a little bit about like maybe your thought process, like were you nervous or were you just like super excited? Yeah. Um, I mean, I get nervous for every single project even now like four years in <laughs> um, but i would say my first kind of big project was uh so it was about seven months after i signed with uh step studios where i currently work at um i started on their roster as their lead editor when i was 19 uh, and I, I i talked with the the founder um nick martini and who who, who wanted to bring me on to edit and uh kind of negotiate i was like i'm super down to do this just like I would love just any opportunity to direct, um, you know, anything that comes down the line doesn't have to be immediate, doesn't have to be a big production. Like I just, just give me a shot. So about seven months into working as a lead editor and, you know, working with a bunch of directors on their roster, like incredibly talented people like Lee Powis, Jess Calhoun, uh, Nick Martini himself. Um, I kind of like developed an eye of what I liked and what I didn't like or how I would do an approach based off of kind of reverse engineering that from editing really talented directors work. Uh, and so about seven months in, first project came in and um, I actually ended up writing on it and sending in a bid and a treatment and uh, the, the client liked the treatment, but I didn't have the work to show for it that I could accomplish it. Most of the stuff I had done was with like an A7S2 um, and wasn't shot with like a Red or an Alexa. And so they liked the concept, but they wanted to work with another director. Um, and so that was kind of a bummer. But then about a month later, uh, another project opportunity came up, which was very much kind of a post heavy, like visual effects project with Red Bull um, and Ninja. And so my first big project was probably was an esports project. Um, and it was when Red Bull redesigned, they first signed Ninja to their esports team and they redesigned his uh like a room in his basement to be like the ultimate streaming place and so i got to go fly out to chicago with uh, another step co-founder cam riley who shot it uh and then worked with my buddy sam wicker who did all the vfx 
And uh, yeah, to this day, I think I still see that ad pop up on my like Twitter and Instagram. Um, but that was that was definitely like the first big project where um, I was lucky enough to have the, the friends and coworkers at Step Studios um, trust me with executing a vision, and uh, it turned out really well. And then after that, kind of a snowball effect, and just kind of kept going and going. Right. Taking it back a little bit, I know when you were about 15 years old, uh, you won your first film festival, if I'm saying yeah. that correctly. Um, how how did you go about that? And how did you even like know that you wanted to be in a film festival um, at that of a young age? Because that is such a young age, you know, to be competing for that. Um, what brought you to that place? Yeah. Um, well, initially, I first started out making skate videos with my friends. Um, like that was, the, that was the first thing I did. I first picked up a camera cause I was like, I really want to film all these cool tricks that we're doing. Uh, and then it, it kind of, my parents actually noticed that a lot of times I would focus a little bit more on like the skater's journey of like accomplishing a trick rather than just the trick itself. And so um, when I was 13, I enrolled in uh, a couple college courses at Santa Barbara um, City College or film school, uh, advanced editing and um, documentary filmmaking, where I kind of learned some of the, you know, structural parts of creating a film and got my first taste of, you know, being a, approaching filming something that's driven by story rather than just filming cool things and trying to put it together editing. And I ended up working on a, a documentary and I submitted that to get involved as a finalist for this film festival competition, it was called the 10, 10, 10, where they selected 10 filmmakers, um, gave them 10 days to make a 10 minute film. And they all screened at the end of the Santa Barbara International Film Festival. And uh, I, I was lucky enough to get into that competition. And I grew up playing sports and I've, I've always been super competitive. And so my first taste of creating actual film, I wasn't even so much concentrated on the like artistic aspect because I, I didn't have a style. It was my first time making something. I just knew I wanted to win it. And so I used all of my resources and they gave you mentors um, that would help you with write your script. And they had like an Academy Award winning editor, Arthur Schmidt, who edited like Roger Rabbit and he was available as a resource. And so I just used all the resources that, you know, were available to me, tried to work with people that I enjoyed their work and were more talented and put together a crew. And, um, you know, it was, I was a sophomore in high school and it was a high school competition and uh, lucky enough to come away with a first place title. And that was like, that was it. I was like, all right, this is my thing. I'm, this is something that I feel like I'm fairly good at. So I should probably pursue this for the rest of my life. <laughs> <laughs> right on. And for some people out there who might be kind of like young right now and they're looking to get into film festivals, um, what would be a piece of advice you would give to them? Um, you know, concentrate on, on story. Um, and if you aren't a super experienced storyteller, like find an awesome screenwriter. Um, if, if you're more of like an executionary, a, part of it, like you're really good at going out and making things happen, but you're struggling finding a story, search and work with some other people that, you know, maybe they struggle with getting their stories created, but they're really good at writing stories. Um, I was lucky enough for the competition, I was the director and I got paired with a screenwriter who already had a script. And so I was able to kind of take my work as, you know, someone that enjoyed filming things and had experience with that and then pair it with a screenwriter who had experience screenwriting. Um, and that was my kind of first taste of working with people that you want to learn from. Um, and that's something that I, I learned at a young age and I've been kind of trying to apply towards, I think even to this day, I, I really try and surround myself with people that I can learn from people that are more talented than me. Cause I don't think anyone's ever learned from, you know, you, you don't learn from doing things exactly how you know how to do them. You do them from learning from other people and surrounding yourself with people that you can learn from. And like, that's, that's the main reason I would say why I was able to get to where I'm at at a young age was just, I, I trusted that other people would help teach me how to, you know, 
move faster up the ladder or, um, you know, mm -hmm. surrounding yourself with people that have been doing it for 10, 15 years, like that's how you're going to learn the most. And even if that's like driving a grip truck, like that was like literally how I got my first like stuff, like opportunities or met my, met my friends. That I ended up like shooting stuff with was I would, I was like 17 and I was like, Hey, can I get on the set? And they're like, Hey, we need someone to drive grip trucks back and we have no budget. We can't pay you. Like, are you down? I'm like, I'm down. If you like, let me come on set. <laughs> so like literally just like scraping the bottom of the barrel to just create relationships. Um, a hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. Creating relationships and finding a mentor. I think those are two things that have been frequently mentioned on this live stream. It's so important. I think to like, I don't know, get out of your comfort zone and, and whatever way possible, you know, introduce yourself to somebody who's in the industry. I think one of the things that kind of jump started our career is uh, Poi actually used to do background acting and he used to go right. on set for like eight to 12 hour days and just kind of like talk to people and being able to like observe what they were doing. And that kind of like re sparked that interest into film, which ultimately kind of led us to, you know, doing what we do now. But yeah, hundred percent, like finding a mentor who would, who would you say in your life or, you know, up to where you are right now has been, um, I guess the most influential to you in your pursuit of, of filmmaking. Yeah, I would say probably, I mean, it's interesting cause I would say my dad, but he doesn't, I don't have any family connections to like the industry. Like I, 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 but his work ethic and his approach where like he designs and builds houses, but he started out making cabinets and then, but he would, people would be really excited with the work he did. So you get a better opportunity. Um, and so kind of working up the ladder, that's kind of where I learned that from. But as far as like mentor wise, I would have to say Nick Martini. Um, he, he was the guy, he found co-founder of stepped. He gave me my first opportunity. Um, he trusted me and he was someone that I really learned from how to operate and navigate the industry, how to approach a project, how to write a treatment, how to, you know, do it all. And so, um, he trusted me at a really young age and, um, you know, I'm, I'm really, really thankful for that opportunity. And, and it's, 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 I think it's come back and I think it's benefited all of us. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I'd say my dad and my dad and Nick Martinez, it's funny actually when, when I was first signing, um, with step to come on and edit when I was 18, uh, my dad was like, all right, if you'd like sign this contract or like, you're not going to go back to school. So he's like, I want to come up and like meet this guy. And so I had my dad meet my potential employer and we went out for like lunch. And then after my dad was like, yeah, no, I like these guys. I think it was a good, this is a good choice. So um, pretty funny story having those two guys meet, but uh, yeah. yeah, it's like, it's like taking your dad to a job interview. <laughs> yeah, no, <laughs> seriously. In a way. So yeah, no, it, it was hilarious and it was funny. Like we were there and my dad was like, you know, like, I wants to direct and I'm like, dad, shut up. I already talked to him about that. <laughs> That's so funny. Actually, we, you kind of touched upon school. I want to go back to that because I know we kind of had like a mini conversation before we started the live stream. Um, but if you could tell everybody who's listening right now, you're, you're kind of like entry into school and then your decision to leave. I think that's just such a, a you know, an interesting perspective because we, we've talked about school like several times on this thing, but I feel like you had a taste of both, right? Like you had your foot in the, in, in school and then you kind of left. So can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, no, for sure. Um, so to go back to the beginning, uh, when I was applying to colleges, I toured USC, I toured a couple other film schools, toured Chapman and, um, I ended up only applying to Chapman because I, uh, I really wanted to go there. And my only other option I was totally comfortable with, I was like, if I don't get in here, I'm just gonna move straight to LA and get started in the film industry. So I was kind of like, from the get-go, I was okay with not going to college. I was okay with going to college. So I ended up going to Chapman and I spent my fr freshman year there at the film school. And like, to be completely honest, I did not do much. Like I did not <laughs> get as involved as I should have. Uh, I kind of right. spent my freshman year kind of partying it away and having fun as I should, but I got towards the end and I kind of was like, holy crap, like I just wasted away my freshman year. So I got this little chip on my shoulder and 
that summer came around, I was like, I'm going to get involved with as much shit as I possibly can. Edit as many music videos as I get on every single set. And um, Chapman had this thing called Chapman Film Connection, where it was like, you know, four or 5,000 people all posted, you know, they needed a PA, they needed an editor, they needed this. And uh, I just got on that and was just habitually getting onto every single set I could. I actually got lost in it to the point where someone told me, it's like, yo, have you like a, have you, have you chosen the classes you're taking for your sophomore year? I was like, what are you talking about? They're like, school starts in a week. And I was like, I'm in the middle of <laughs> projects. Like, I can't do that. So I decided to take a little bit of uh, some time off. I'd still sign my lease, so I was still living there. But all of the initial connections that I made were through film school. And so while it wasn't, I wasn't directly like doing stuff with the film school, I was working with the people that I'd met at the film school and the community that was created there. And so I then used those connections to keep myself busy and like keep myself employed during these times. Um, and so I ended up living, still living at Chapman and I would spend time, hang out with my friends, but then on the weekends and then on Monday through Friday, I would usually go to LA. And when I first signed with Step, I actually commuted from Orange County to Los Angeles for seven months. Um, but school, is, it's interesting. I like, like you're never gonna hear me say like, don't go to film school, because film school is amazing. Like, but I don't think it's really about like the schooling aspect. Like, mm -hmm. It's not I think about it's, the courses. No, it's about the, the community and how involved you get. And you could go to the best film school like in the world, but if you're only taking the classes, doing the assignments, I don't think you're, I don't think that's the point of film school. I think the point of film school is to like meet collaborators that you're going to work with for the rest of your life. And like, that's, that's really what it is. Like I still work with people that I met at Chapman and like my best friends that I live with and my, some of my like directors, friends that I work with, they all went to Chapman. And so those relationships like, stand the test of time but i think school is really a place of like testing like yo can you take advantage of the opportunities that are in front of you and you know i think some people can create those opportunities without going to school and some people school's a really great place to create those opportunities because it kind of surrounds you with like-minded people but by no means is like anything a you know a tell-all you know if you go to film school you're not gonna you're not guaranteed to work in the industry you know, you gotta, you're like, I think a lot of people went, go to film school and they're like, all right, I'm going to get out and I'm going to direct things. And it's like, that's only possible during film school, you're directing things. Or if you want to shoot things, like if during film school, you're shooting things, not just your thesis, not just the projects you're assigned to, but going out on weekends and shooting music videos or shooting small commercials or, you know, forming the crew that you're going to work with for, you know, the following years. And that's kind of how I view film school. So I still took advantage of film school and the resources around me, I just kind of like didn't really take the classes, I would say. Right. So, I think it's, like it's so important. I think every single person we've brought on to the show so far has talked about connections and how important they are. And I don't think there's been no one who's came on this podcast so far has been like, Hey, like go to school for the work right it's always been the connection every mm -hmm. single person so anyone listening here today who wants to go to school um just make sure that you know you're going there for the connections of it and make as much connections as you can yeah um and also mm -hmm. like don't be afraid to like like work in places that you don't want to work like i knew very early on that i wanted to direct but I knew I wasn't going to get opportunities to direct by just sitting on my ass and being like, all right, like I'm going to wait for a directing opportunity to come to me. And so I knew I could get in front of people through my editing work. And so I worked with a bunch of directors that I respected and I thought were really talented through editing. And like through that process, I kind of learned how they work and I learned like what their process was, the things I liked, the things I didn't like. But you know, if, if you're, if you want to direct, like, edit for directors that you think are really talented. And it, it also like money was never like, I would say for the first like two years, I was, you know, was barely making anything, but I was passionate about what I was doing and I knew I was learning a bunch. 
And so if there's opportunities and there might not be money attached to it, like, like scale what you do by the opportunity and what this is going to look like on your resume versus like, you know, nickel and diming of how much you're going to get off. Because like there are nights where I work mm -hmm. full all nighters or in like work for like three days straight editing something. And I, I was getting paid like 250 bucks or something. But I was like, this is a relationship I really want to preserve and I want to impress them. And then like a couple months down the line, that same relationship gave me an opportunity. And so, yeah, it's like, if you want to be a cinematographer, like try and be an assistant camera or second assistant camera to a cinematographer that you really like and enjoy. So um, yeah, it's like not being afraid to just, you know, eat, eat shit for a couple of years because that's, <laughs> that's going to eventually lead to really great opportunities. 100%, 100%. I feel like, um honestly you just said it so elegantly we've talked about it so many times in the show like going out and, and and just doing whatever you need to do to get your foot in the door to introduce yourself and i just think you just said it so well especially through your story and your example um touching upon like the editing aspect i think it's really cool because even in my in, like our own personal experience like we started off you know editing before becoming professional directors right like directing for clients with these concepts how did for you did editing translate to becoming a better director? You know, like, was it, was there, what was the creative thought process you had during editing, you know, like, and, and how did that help you become a director, a better director, I should say? Yeah, for sure. Um, so there's, there's basically like two opportunities to tell, to, to create the story for whatever, whatever the project you're doing. You write the treatment, you come up with a shooting plan of what you're going to shoot, how you're going to tell the story. You go out and shoot it. And like, that's the first half of it. And then editing and putting everything together is the second half of it. And it's now you're trying to figure out what story you can tell with the footage that you've shot. Um, and so it's really, it's really is like directing. You just, you rather than determining what you're going to shoot, you have what you have. And now you're determining how you present that. And I would say my my main thing that I learned was just creating uh, creating stories. And whether it's just like a product story, whether it's like creating some sort of art where there's a beginning, middle, and end, um, where it's not just like you know cool transitions or cool shit, like creating something that has somewhat of an art. Um, that was something that I learned through editing with these directors because. You know, these directors had a vision of, you know, I want this to start this way, like middle is going to be like this and then we're going to end on this. And it taught me it's like every single project you approach, it's like have a plan to create a well-rounded arc. And even if that arc is a product arc or, you know, a character story arc or it's like you're shooting a location, create a location arc. Um, it's that was the main thing is like you want to try and inject classical storytelling in everything you could possibly do. Because that's like, that stands the test of time. Like storytelling is something that humans innately love and have been sharing stories since we we're freaking cavemen. <laughs> and so mm -hmm. is figuring out a way to tell a story and tell an arc and have it not just be a compilation of like interesting shots or moments is creating something that your viewer can recognize as we started here, this was our journey and we ended here. Cause that'll give you something that feels like a, like a, a professional commercial it feels like, you know, a brilliant music video or a great short film. Things that are just a compilation of like interestingly shot stuff that don't necessarily have a story to it. That's kind of, as far as for me, that was the main thing I learned is like in that step is approaching it as a storyteller. And um, yeah, I think I really dialed that in editing and then also allowed me to like reverse engineer of, okay, they're telling the story of this person or this athlete or this product. And then being like, what did they, the decisions that these people made in order to go out and capture, you know, to tell this story, editing, I'll be like, oh, okay, they did this. Oh, they did this. Oh, they did that. And then being able to kind of gather that information, store it in the back of my head for when I had an opportunity to direct, to direct, it just like, that's how I was able to take everything I learned from editing other people. 
Mm -hmm. um, I'm just going to take a quick pause for a second because I noticed people are asking questions in the comments. Um, if you guys want to ask Pat a question, there is a little question mark box beside the comments. Leave your questions there, and when we get uh, near the end of the podcast, we'll try to answer those. It's just because we can't like go and answer them right now while we're you know in the middle of, of, of you know talking to Pat. Um, but yeah. Um, we did, have, since we are on directing, I feel like a lot of, uh, directors have different styles and paths they take in their directing. Uh, could you go a little bit over how your style is different and how, um, you know, you go about directing a project when it comes to you? Yeah. Um, this is really interesting because I, I feel like I'm still at a point in my career where, like, I don't personally know, like, my style. Like, it's really interesting to hear people who, like, watch my work and be like, oh, like, this is your style. I'm like, I had no idea. Um, I would say I probably, like, develop my style from really, you look at a project and you try and approach every single aspect of it in the best way you can. And if you're the one making the decisions of what you think is the best way to approach this, eventually, you know, there's going to be congruencies and similarities amongst the projects that you do. And so um, I would say it doesn't, it's not necessarily like a conscious thing. I mean, it can be a conscious thing if you want to approach something in, in a similar way, but I would say it really comes from, you know, taking a project and being like, I want to do it this way because I think this is the best way to capture the shot, or I think this is the best way to shoot this scene. And so, by doing that across all, like I think this is the best way to edit it. I think this is the best music to put towards this. I think this is the best sound design. I think this is the best color grade. I think, and so taking that and like leaning into your passions and what you think is great and what you want to do is that's, that's how I feel like my style has, has developed is it's not necessarily this preemptive thing that I'm thinking of, hey, I'm gonna approach this in this style. It's, I'm gonna try and make this as good as it possibly can how do I do that? Um, and then it just naturally kind of comes about it, from my experience. Um, but then it's like, that's as far as like for like commercial stuff, when you're getting like short films and stuff, you know, if you're doing a, a horror film, that's a genre and there's rules there. Or if you're doing a comedy, that's a genre and there's rules there. Um, but as far as like approaching commercial work, I really just try and put my stamp on it. And I, I don't try and like mimic kind of what other people are doing. Um, and I think that's 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 a big thing right now. You know, I feel like my like Instagram is just like flooded with, you know, try out this camera technique, and then you have like thousands of people execute that camera technique. But it's like, why are you executing that camera technique? Does that benefit the story you're trying to tell? Is that like getting down to the like nitty gritty and being super super kind of um, intentional with the things that you're doing? That's how you create your style, rather than trying to mimic or copy other things that you see. It's great to take inspiration, but if you have a project, like that project is original. And so treat it as an original project. Don't take an opportunity or project you have and be like, hey, I want it to look exactly like how this person did it and try and mimic it, you know, to a T. It's take that yeah. the things that you've learned and the things that you've digested in your mind and then, okay, how am I gonna approach this in an original way and create a look that, you know, hasn't been executed before. Mm -hmm. I think I think it comes down to an intention as well, right? Like if you are, like you said, planning on using a transition, like what's the intention behind it? Like, you know, is it enhancing the story? I think I think you said that really, really well. Um, same thing with looks, right? Like when you're compiling a lookbook or a mood board or whatever, and you're like compiling these looks, they're from other creatives and you're not stealing the idea necessarily, but you're using it as inspiration because your intention is to replicate this feeling of loneliness or drama or whatever it may be. I think, I think that's really, um, really a good point there. Um, did you have any question? Yeah. I, do <laughs> I got actually. blank for a second there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, we were, I also blank. we were, we were talking about directing, um, all right, we're just going to move on to the next question because I blanked as well. I have, I have a personal question just because I know you're really young and you're probably one of the youngest directors in your studio right now. Do you, do you like, do you ever feel 
that you have, you're like the underdog in your studio, you know, like, are you competing with other more experienced directors to land a client? Like what is kind of like your, your standpoint in your, in your yeah. studio? Yeah. I mean, so I'm, I'm lucky enough to be, you know, be joined with some incredibly talented directors on a roster. And one of the cool things about that is they all have their kind of niches, you know, that they're really good at. And like, for example, like mm -hmm. Dana Romanoff is an incredible documentary filmmaker we have on our roster. I don't think I could do the things that she does. And whereas I like end up in this kind of more kind of commercial, uh, you know, I like to inject a lot of visual effects and kind of execute things. I don't know. It's like we all have our different styles. And so I never feel like I'm competing against the people that are within our own internal team. But as far as like when it comes to production bids and whatnot, you know, majority of the time when a brand is asking for a project um, or they come to you with a, a concept is you're triple bidding. And so you're creating a treatment and a budget and an approach of how you're going to accomplish this project. And there's two other production companies that have directors that they're putting up that they think are going to be great for this project. And so every every project before you get awarded it is usually there's you're competing against at least two other people. Um, right. And I would I mean, going back to like, like the first film I ever did was I, I feel like I I feel like I did well in that because I thought of it as a competition. Like, as I, I still think of everything as a competition. Like every project I get to, I think of like, this has to be better than the last project I did. Otherwise people are going to think I'm a fraud and I can't like, like I, it needs to be better. Like I, I go with the, the, the thinking that like, if, if my latest project is what's going to give me my next project. Um, but as far as like within, you know, I would say in the, in the, in the initial and in like the very beginning of my career, I definitely felt like, like, Oh, I need to be better than these people. I need to like do this. I need to execute this. And that I feel like is like, it's good to see work and be impressed by it and be like, okay, I want to do something like that. But, um, I think if you drown yourself with other work, like, and you're just constantly watching other things that are being created, um, I think it can have a negative effect because it kind of strips you of having an original approach on things. And so while I love and appreciate all directors work and like, there's a lot of directors out there where I could never do what they do. Um, I try not to compare myself too much and I try more so to compare to my previous projects and see how I'm improving, see how I can take new things that I learned and apply them to these new projects and kind of constantly be learning. Um, but I definitely do feel like everyone is, everyone does compare themselves to other directors. Um, that's just like innately in, in every industry, people compare themselves to their, their competitors. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. um, one of the cool things about film is that everyone has like their own original style and their own approach. And while there can be similarities amongst certain directors, um, you know, we're all our own independent thinkers. And I think that's what, that's what makes a director great, I think, is their ability to think independently and not be like overly influenced by like all the shit that's happening around them. Mm -hmm. Right. I kind of want to talk about emotions since we're on mindset and emotion. Um, yeah. Earlier you were saying you still get nervous um, when new projects come up. How do you yeah. deal with that nervousness when it approaches? Like what's your mindset behind that? you just work like work harder like that's that's really like the only way to remove your nervousness is to get to a point where you're like so prepared that you, literally any curveball anything that comes your way you're prepared for and you're going to tackle like i think like the most nervous i've ever been like on set like actually directing with like client that clients there talent there you got like a 30 person crew that's all like waiting on your direction. Like, Hey, what are we going to be doing? The only time that I've ever truly felt nervous is when I didn't have enough time to prepare, but like my favorite projects that I've ever done and like the best work that I feel like I've, I've ever done has come from just meticulous planning and planning with your first AD on your schedule, planning with your, your, uh, your cinematographer on a lighting plan. I think most recently I just did a shoot, um, I, I wish I could talk more about it, but I had to sign an NDA. 
uh, where I work with my DP, uh, Aiden Ulrich, and I don't know if you've ever heard of Cine Tracer. It's basically like, if you've ever played Tony Hawk Pro Skater and made your own skate park, it's basically that, but with lights. And you can design your own <laughs> scenes and you can light them, um, you know, and create your lighting setups and you can like import, you know, we were shooting in a, uh, in a like a, an L wall studio with a psych and we had a pole here and we had an overhead grid for lights. We literally just, we lit every single scene and set up in this fictitious world. And then we took a wide shot, we took a screenshot of it and then we brought it on set. And then we connected with our grip team and our gaff team. We said, these are all of our setups. This light needs to go exactly here. Like this is the look that we're going for. This is the reason why we're doing it. We got everyone on the same page. And then the set just ran completely seamlessly. And it was, it was the most incredible experience because it just was so smooth and working. And the only way that that's possible is just with meticulous prep. And when you prep enough and when you put like, this was like two weeks of like 10 hour days of, of just constantly, constantly working to refine your approach, refine like how you were going to be, you know, executing this. And then when it came to the day and, you know, the day before the shoot, we're, we're all, we're all hanging out, grabbing dinner. We're like, yo, is there anything you guys want to talk about like prepping for this? And everyone was like, no, we feel fully prepared. And that was like the least nervous I've ever been, but it was like my biggest project yet. And so I would say if you ever feel nervous on a project, like, I just don't think you prepped enough, <laughs> you know, it's like, that is like, that is the tool to solve nervousness for a project is just go in and there's still always going to be an amount of the, amount of that i think that's what actually makes your work better is that if like that sense of nervousness or that sense of uh shit like i hope this i hope this one isn't the one where people you know where i mess up is that motivates you to work harder and that's kind mm -hmm. of been my approach on everything so mm -hmm. i think nervousness is also like an indication that like you actually care about the work you're trying to produce. Because if you ask anybody yeah. who's like not nervous, it's probably because they don't they don't mm -hmm. care what happens, right? 100%, 100%. <laughs> and it's like you walk this like work-life balance of like, oh, it's work and then I have my outside life. But it's like, no, like I, 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 I value like a big part of me is like being a filmmaker. And so I do have that work-life separation where I like, okay, I gotta enjoy my life in order to enjoy my work. But treating a job like, oh, this is just a job, I'm not gonna worry about it. Like, I can't do that. Like, I like filmmaking is such a part of me that it, I can't separate those two. And so if I mess up on a project, you know, I, I take it personally, I'm like, I disappointed myself. But um, that hasn't happened too much, I don't <laughs> <laughs> All right. That's actually a really uh, interesting topic. I think I'd, I'd like to kind of go over too, just like, dealing with failures because there's been so many times like where you know communication is obviously key but sometimes maybe there's a miscommunication and you deliver a product that the client isn't fully happy about and then you know then you're getting the shit end of the stick and you need to make revisions or do a reshoot you know how do you handle that i clearly you have a very optimistic mindset and you're very good at, at learning how to grow from your mistakes but you know, in your deepest, darkest moments, like, what are you thinking and how do you combat those negative emotions and thoughts? Mm -hmm. um, honestly, I feel like it just comes down to miscommunication. Like, sometimes, I don't know, I, I've met I've met people that kind of view the client that they're mm -hmm. working for as like, you know, they don't really value their opinion or like, hey, I want, I'm going to do this exactly how I want to do it and you know not necessarily inform the client on that and then that leads to miscommunication and leads to issues in the edit whereas if you are if you send your client a treatment and you're like yo these are the shots that we're shooting these are the locations this these are our talent this is the art this is the story we're trying to tell this is how we're going to shoot it this is our approach to editing so that's really with like when you're sending off a treatment to a client you basically you want them to run through the 15 or 30 page deck and be like, okay, I have an understanding of how this is going to look. And everything down from the soundtrack, how it gets pieced together, what you're shooting on, the team that you're bringing in. 
And then on set, when you're working with the clients, like I always like, if there's a shot that I'm really excited about, I bring my director monitor over to the client. I'm like, Hey, check this out. Like, so this is why we're doing this. This is that. And like, like, appreciate, like if you have any input, let me know. And I just try and create like a positive experience for the client is like, I never view them as like an adversary or like getting in the way of work. Um, <laughs> it's, it, it's really, if you view them as a collaborator and also if, <laughs> if you can help them feel like they had a part in the project and like, if one of your ideas, if you're like, Hey, I thought of this because you put this thought into my mind and this idea stemmed from here, it's like, it leaves a client feeling like they had some input and regardless of what you make, if you have someone that feels like you positively like took in their input and put it into the project is they're going to be much happier at the end of the day. And so I've been really fortunate where I, I don't think I've had something where there was like a complete lack of communication and the client was like, what the hell is this? This is awful. This is not what we asked for. And like the few times where that has happened, you, you like, <laughs> you check the receipts. You're like, Hey, the, we told you it was going to be like this. Like, what do you mean you wanted it like this? And so then they're able to be like, oh, okay, no, you're right. No, this is what we talked about, but now we want to move in a different direction. So let's work towards that. And so I think never viewing like the client as an adversary and making sure that you're going to, it's going to be the most positive experience if you keep them involved and it doesn't even mean neat. Like you can still disagree with their ideas, but you just need to like explain why you're going in a different direction. Um, so yeah, I feel like, you know, I think in, in my like darkest times of being like, Oh my God, I like, I, I could have done better on this is it's like, okay, how can I make the most of this right now? And it's some of my, my grandpa always said, which was like, look for the good, like look for the good in the client, look for the good in the edit, look for the good in the talent you're shooting, the crew that you're working with. And you know, if you, if you focus on making it a positive experience for everyone, it, you're, you're going to set yourself up for, if you do run into those obstacles, it's not going to be met with animosity. Those are really good points. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think, I think the main thing that you talked about in the very beginning was communication, right? Constantly, all the time, every decision that you make on behalf of the client for their vision, for their project, you're just making sure they know exactly what you're doing at all times to kind of prevent that from happening. But 100%, there are once in a while, those, uh, clients that, you know, the chain of command, maybe the, this person is talking to this person who's talking to you and stuff just happens, but it's really good to know that um, the answer to that question is just to have like this growth mindset and then just kind of like answering the questions and making sure that you are going to readjust to kind of like re-help create their vision. Um, we're kind of coming close to the end. I just have like a couple more questions. Where, where do you see yourself in like the next five years, right? Like you've been in the studio for four years now, you know, you went from editing to directing, you know, where, where is your ambition going to take you next? Like what, what do you see happening for yourself in the next five years? Yeah. Um, so I mean, next five years, I, I still plan to be with, um, step studios as you know, they're, they're, they're pretty much like family to me now. Um, and they've also been growing their department of, you know, they've been creating original content and we're, you know, hopefully going to be opening up some actual studios where we can like, you know, have a full site, have a full green screen set up. Um, we have a full rental house now. We just opened up a, a post house. Um, and now we're getting into original content. And so I would say five years, um, you know, I want to definitely have my first feature under my belt. Uh, I spent the first two months of this year kind of flushing out what I'm trying to be, you know, the, the story and the feature and the, the what inspires me and what do I really like? What are my favorite films? Um, and so I would say in five years, like the goal is to definitely have, um, have a feature under my belt and have pitched like a couple TV shows. Um, whether those be like animated series. Like I love, I love Rick and Morty as much as I love Christopher Nolan. Like, and <laughs> I don't think that you need to, you need to choose one or the other. Um, and so I definitely have been exploring kind of 
as a as my roots were more in like the narrative filmmaking genre and you know last few years i've been more so in commercial stuff is now bringing the things that i've learned on set in commercial productions and bringing those to a, a short a short film that's a proof of concept for a feature um and with that like i'm a huge like sci-fi world building my favorite my favorite films are like star wars lord of the rings uh Dark Knight, uh, Interstellar. Like I love, I don't get me wrong. Like I love, you know, films that take place in like our world that we can relate to. And, but I really, really like when a film can literally take me out of this world and I'm drawn to the characters and I, I connect to them emotionally, but it's a story that is completely, you know, original or it's a new world that's been thought of. And I, I had my first taste of that on, um, the League of Legends uh, World's Finals trailer that I did, where we had our, our one subject, Rivington, who was a commentator, and we shot him in this massive green screen room. And we had all these like lighting cues that kind of motivated, like, okay, this is the scene. And we built a world with our CG team beforehand, and we, and we kind of knew the world that he was going to be living in. And then we used lighting cues and stuff to connect him to that world. And I was lucky enough to get paired with uh, Ruel Smith, who's now the head of our VFX department. Um, and he has, for the last like six years, worked as a VFX supervisor on like Black Panther, Captain Marvel, where the wild things are. And so he really helped kind of teach me how to kind of like think in this world and how to like, you know, accomplish a vision that is, you know, you're creating or create this like fictitious world. And now I'm like, okay, if I have the ability to create a world that is completely new to the eye, like that's what I want to do. Cause like, I enjoy, I, I enjoy costume design. I enjoy set building. I enjoy, you know, I, I enjoy every single aspect of it. And so like, I, that's, I just, I love, I love world building. I love things that kind of take you out of, out of this world and transport you to a whole nother dimension. I just, that's what I want to do. And so, you know, a sci-fi like action packed story with, um, but something that has like a really great story behind it. So, you know, like Interstellar, for example, like I, lo I love Christopher Nolan film because like he, he loves practical, like crazy fucking explosions and like incredible action sequences, but they always like at the core of it, it's like a really great story. And he's not just throwing shit in there for effect of like, and then forms a story around that is it's really a, yeah. Any, any kind of like sci-fi action film with a brilliant story behind it. That's, that's my main, that's my thing. So five years from now, hopefully I have one of those under my belt. <laughs> well, I, 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 I'm pretty sure I can speak on behalf of everybody who's been watching this podcast, but we can clearly tell that you're like a motivated, hardworking guy and you've got the mentors and, you know, the right resources in place. And I think five years from now, you know, we're going to be seeing trailers director patrick hall all over the place man and it'd be super exciting to see where you are um where you're going to be in five years and i think uh, everyone here has been is rooting for you i'm not sure if, if you had a chance but if you take a look at the comments everyone has just been saying like how awesome you are and and how much they support <laughs> you so yeah man i think you got um i think you got the right mindset to to make it in this career and you know, five years from now, um, you know, we're, we're going to see your dreams come true. I, I also like the like the way you kind of described filmmaking in the sense of creating this world. Because, yes, like we are creating stories. We are making worlds. But you kind of like kind of gave me a new perspective on like, like, especially when you talked about Rick and Morty, like creating this alternate universe. You know what I mean? Designing the costume, designing the characters, you know, sci-fi and action mixed together to like this dystopian universe. It's just a really cool way of interpreting uh, um, filmmaking in that sense. So thank you for that fresh perspective. Um, yeah, of course. We're just going to quickly take a look here to see if anybody had any questions because we're we're almost at that hour mark and we're sure that you know we, we want you to enjoy the rest of your day, of course. While um, we do look for a question, um, we did have one more question for you is yeah. what advice would you give to someone pursuing, wanting to pursue a career like yours? Um, uh, let's see. <laughs> or, a couple even, things. or even if you were, no, 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 if it's a good question. Were, 
Yeah, even if you were to like go back to your old self, like getting started and telling yourself something, like what would that be? Yeah, um, just like work your ass off. Like it, it, it really like there's no magic equation. There's no, there's nothing where it's like, oh, this person has great ideas and like that's why they're going to be successful. It's like it really just comes down to hard work. And one of the things that I've realize is, is word spreads fast in our industry like the more the the longer you're in the, in the industry you realize how small it is and if if someone like was mean or a dick on set and like they didn't treat their crew right or like people are going to learn about that or like but also on the flip hand like if there's someone's like yo this guy like worked his ass off he stayed long he, like he edited this shit in like two days he stayed overnight like if you can leave people with a positive experience of working with you, like that will like word of mouth spreads quickly. And so mm -hmm. it's like, that's, that was my mindset and still my mind's on every single project. I'm like these 30, 45 people that I'm working with, they're all going to walk away and have something to say about like their experience working with me. And I never, ever want someone to have like a bad taste in their mouth. Like I always want them to be really excited to work with me again. And um, so, yeah, it's like, there's no secret equation. You just got to work your ass off. And then on top of that is surround yourself with people that are more talented than you. Like, I, I still feel like I do that to this day. Like every, every time I'm working on a project, like I really try and get involved and work with people that I respect and love their work. And I, I'm super grateful that I have the ability to do that as a director and help kind of like work with them to create a vision. But at the early stages, like I was an assistant editor, I was an editor, I was driving grip trucks, I was doing this. And it's like, even if, you know, you're there to PA on set, but it's be the director of the set or the cinematographer of the set is someone you really respect, like, they will take the, if they're a good person, they will take the time to talk to you. Like, I, I love talking to like other mem like members of our crew and stuff. And like, if they have questions like, yo, how'd you end up here? Like, I'll take the time and talk to them. And like, I'm not the only one who does that. Like people are happy to share their information and, you know, lean into that. Like understand that if you try and approach a project with what you know currently, and that's the limit of like the project you're doing, like that's why you know, sometimes you might not see much growth in the projects you're doing versus if you get people involved that you respect and like their work, you know, you're going to, you're going to develop, you're going to learn from them. And even if you're just PAing on set or driving a grip truck or like doing anything, if there's people on that set that you respect and you can watch them work and you can learn from them. Like I'm someone who really, really has to learn from example and be involved. And that's how I, that's how I grow. And that's how I learn. And so at any level, like, don't be afraid to get involved and don't be afraid to eat shit for a couple of years. If, you know, if you want to make it to where you want to be. Um, but yeah, I would say work your ass off and surround yourself with people that you really respect. That's awesome. That's awesome. Honestly, I think we can kind of end the stream on that because those last words were just so impactful. Um, I, I really think we could just kind of close off on that. If people want to find you, if they don't have you on Instagram, if they don't have you on YouTube, whatever, how can they find you? Um, I have like a Vimeo account. <laughs> um, <laughs> I have a, yeah, I have a Vimeo account and um, I have my Instagram. And then if you, I'm on the Step Studio website in their director page. So um, yeah, I mean, that, that would be the best way. Or just like wait for some cool ads to come out. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I don't want those ads <laughs> right on for those people who are listening on the podcast um, wherever you're listening from if you do want to connect with Pat uh, his Instagram is pw.hall h-a-l-l -H -A -L -L. Um, so just reach out to him if you have any questions I'm sure he'd be happy to answer them um, and connect with you as well aside from that we are good to go here. Thank you so much, Pat, for hopping on. We really appreciate your time. And I think for whoever's listening here, they gotten so much value out of this one. It was truly an honor 
we got so much value out of it as well. I'm sure Danny has too. So thank you so much for hopping on with us. Yeah, thanks for having me. This has been a blast. Hope you guys have a good day. Thanks, man. You too, man. All, All right. right. Thanks. Cheers. Closing off. Amazing. For people listening on the podcast, um, well, Instagram, thanks for hopping on, guys. I hope you guys enjoyed it. For people on the podcast, um, I hope you had an amazing time. If you guys do hear this and you do want to support the podcast, uh, if you are on Apple Podcasts, please, please, please leave us a review and share your experience of how you like this. We would really appreciate it. Aside from that, thank you.